this is Majin Sweet, and welcome to Demon Souls in Game Design. We're going to play through Demon Souls and try to analyze our game design perspective to see where all the fundamental aspects of Souls came from. Because I would say is a lot of people kind of talk badly about Demon Souls these days. Some people will say it's like the Dark Souls beta, and I don't think that's really true. I think a lot of the fundamental aspects that make Souls what it is existed right there in Demon Souls. While Demon Souls may have lacked polish, the fundamental aspects of the game shine through. So, let's start right in. Let's name myself Majin Sweet. And right from the get-go, what sets Souls apart from many other games of its time is, you have a starting class where you it doesn't really matter in the long run, which is usually very different from RPGs like say like Bethesda games where if you want to be optimal or have a perfect build the starting attributes matter a lot and souls it doesn't really work that way they're very while you can be more optimal for picking a certain class it's usually only very minor it's only the difference of maybe a few points and especially in a first playthrough it usually doesn't matter at all it's more about it's really more about role playing than anything and i think that's good the i feel like in an RPG role-playing game, the stats should be to role-play. King Alant the Twelfth, by channeling the power of souls, brought unprecedented prosperity to his northern kingdom of Boletaria. That is, until the colorless deep fog swept across the land. Boletaria was cut off from the outside world. And those who dared penetrate the deep fog never returned. But Valarfax of the royal twin fangs broke free from the fog and told the world of Boletaria's plight. That the old king Alant had aroused the old one, the great beast below the nexus, from its eternal slumber. And that a colorless fog had swept in unleashing terrible demons. The demons hunt down men and claim their souls. Those who lose their souls also lose their minds. The mad attack the same, and chaos reigns. Valarfax spoke of the enticing power of the demon souls. Each time a demon claims a human soul, the demon's own soul is invigorated by the life force. And the power of a mature demon's soul is beyond human imagination. The legend spread quickly. Mighty warriors were drawn to the accursed land. But none have returned. Bior of the Twin Fangs. Yurt the Silent Chief. Sage Urbane, Skurber the Wanderer, the Sixth Saint Astraea and her knight Garl Vinland, and Sage Freyk the Visionary. The colorless deep fog slowly creeps beyond Boletaria's borders. Humankind faces a slow and steady extinction. The deep fog will eventually swallow all lands near and far. But Boletaria has one final hope. A lone warrior who has braved the baneful fog. Has the land found its savior? Or have the demons found a new slave? So, important thing to note there is that the setup of the story is not really all that different from Dark Souls 1, where immediately we're dropped a lot of exposition that tells us the, basically the main problem of the world. In Dark Souls 1, they talk about the curse of the undead. Here they talk about the curse of, well, not the curse, but the spreading of this fog. It's very similar, both sort, you know, at this point. I shall guide you. 
both uh, narrations name drop a bunch of people that the player will meet later. Some of them enemies in this game, not all of them, but some of them are. So that you may lull the old one back to slumber. So the same type of thing where it's setting up this mystique for people that you're going to meet later on the game. The main difference between the two, though, is that in Dirt, this game, uh, your character's given a little bit more um, hero status in that they talk about, you know, have, has the world found new savior? Where in Dark Souls 1, very immediately your, sh your character's shown to be stuck in the prison. Kind of helpless. Where in... Uh, in, in this game, you know, they say maybe you could, you know, change things. But that, we'll see how that, how Demon Souls course corrects, you could say, to be very similar to, and you know, I want to have the HUD on. Very similar to Dark Souls 1, right after the tutorial. So let's turn the HUD on. Okay, so first thing to note is how Demon Souls has a tutorial. It's even called tutorial. You see that in the top right corner of the screen. If you go here, let's see, there's a part where it actually says, I thought there was, where it actually would say it's tutorial. Well, it does say it in the top left corner of the screen. Oh, actually, it would say it in, yep, right there, tutorial, right in your character. So this area is actually called tutorial. But unlike most games with a tutorial, it still is teaching you about how this game is not going to handhold you. These messages are not forced onto you. There's no scripting. It's up to the player to interact with these, read them, and then use them. You can just run through all this, and I'm sure many first-time players did, just kind of wander through without properly learning about the mechanics that you can learn here. So the game is subtly teaching you, right from the beginning, what kind of what you should expect from this game. That this game isn't going to explain to you uh, in an authoritative way about how to play it. It's going to expect you to figure it out on your own, to a certain extent. And it, they, it, although the combat is very forgiving at this point, you see I got hit quite a few there, quite a few times. There. I didn't lose that much health. But but as I said later earlier, uh, the game is going to course correct on these few things I've been mentioning. Very very. In a very uh, blunt, story-focused kind of way, which I think is really, uh, really effective, which we'll see here. And the game's explaining that there's treasures to find, shows here that there's fall damage in this game. The tutorial's doing a good job of showing a few little nuances of the game. But we're going to hurry through. I think we've seen as much as we need to the tutorial so far, so we'll go to the next area. So the interesting thing about the Demon Souls tutorial, different than the other games, is that it's very out front saying this is a tutorial. And I would say, though, the other games I do believe improved upon this by more integrating the tutorial into the actual game world. Not to say this is terrible, but it is something they did improve upon in Dark Souls in the subsequent games. Because, again, if you're trying to immerse the player in roleplay, it makes sense to have, you know, even a learning experience part of the actual world that the player is going to inhabit. Because, in, you know, if this were, quote unquote, a real experience, there would not be a world called Tutorial, right? So it's it's uh, not, you know, a terrible flaw of this game. It's more of a minor thing, but it is to be noted as something that they did improve on in Dark Souls 1. And we will mention whenever I feel there's something that the future games did improve upon, and that's one of them. Because while Demon Souls, I think, still does hold up, there are definitely many things that the newer games definitely improved upon. So healing items in this game are pretty basic. Um, you collect items that heal you and you use them. Um, one thing that took many people off guard when this game came out in 2009 is that healing takes quite a bit of time. Um, a lot of games of this era had healing that was like instant, instantly activated. And uh, what instant activated heals allow you to do is they allow you to not really have to worry about your HP. You simply notice your HP is getting near death and you just immediately hit the button and you're okay. On Demon Souls you can't do that obviously, be or many games of this style, because if healing leaves you vulnerable, it might not be a good idea to wait till that last moment and you might get hit while trying to do it. A lot of people did not like that when this game came out 
but I think over the years people have started to realize that that adds a lot of strategic depth to the game. Because now, there's a lot more tension when your character is uh, maybe a hit or two away from dying, because you know that healing is not a, a guarantee. You know you're going to have to earn that heal. Which means not only are you going to play in a way to try to avoid that situation entirely, which adds tension, but you're also going to probably try to play much better and tighten up your game when that situation arises. It's one of the fundamental aspects that makes a good action game good. Because you, in a good action game, something as a developer you want to do is create that tension. And one way to do that is with healing that leaves the player vulnerable. Now, the other ways that are more obvious is obviously having a high level of difficulty that challenges the player, enemies that require strategic means to, over, to overtake them. So here's where I talked about how the tutorial does buck, uh, does correct, course correct, quote unquote, to being more like Dark Souls 1. I will play this scenario like most new players probably did when the game came out. Oh wow, look at this giant demon. Oh, I'm actually surprised I'm not getting hit yet. Okay, oh no, oh, uh oh, uh oh. Okay, so that's probably what happened to most new players. And that's the, probably the first time most people saw that message. However, the next trap, you should remain in this world as a soul forever. You died. You died. So that's where the game is now telling you, no, this is a brutally punishing game. You're going to die a lot. It's expected. And here's how they explain to you how this is expected and okay thing with this cutscene that they're about to play. And that's important for player psychology. Player psychology is a major aspect of game design that isn't often talked about, and we're going to talk about it quite a bit while we play through Demon Souls. You have died in the Nexus trapped your soul. You cannot escape the Nexus. However, by capturing demon souls, you can reclaim your physical body. Nexual binding. So this part here, most players, well, I would say almost every first time player is going to think, oh, I was supposed to die. And that little psychological component is telling the player that dying is expected in this game. You have to die, at least they would think so. Well, it's true, in another manner of speaking. You have to die to proceed past the tutorial. The tutorial of this game kills you. That's really important. And another thing about, uh, we mentioned the story also course correcting at this point to be more like Dark Souls 1. We've now seen that maybe uh, our character is not so such a hero, not so uh, fit to uh, be equipped to solve this task. Maybe he's just as helpless as this guy right here. Slipped through the fissure too, did you? You came for demon souls? Or to save this land and be remembered as a hero? <laughs> Hunting for demons? Try one of the arch stones. Now go. That is why you came, is it not? To this accursed volatarium. So that's the second time we've heard someone, then first was the narrator, not this character, referring to, are you going to save this land, or are you lustful for demon souls? They're setting up the fact that this game has a, a uh, character tendency system. It's hard to see here, but that's what the character in the middle of the screen represents. Character tendency, you could basically think similar to like alignment from D&D, good or evil. It's very simplified in this game, but good or evil. 
Um, and this how the story reflects that. Now, every Souls game has had a concept of that to a certain degree. Demon Souls is the only one where it's like, quote unquote, a stat, and you can get certain items based on it. The other games, it's not really like that. Um, and funny, funny to note is that Dark Souls 1 also was going to have something more like that, but it got scrapped. Apparently, there was going to be a quest line, depending on if your character was going to be evil. Uh, the first character in that game, you meet Oscar, was going to be the counterpart to you, and they would interact. You would interact with him, but that got scrapped. So that's actually something that they were going to build upon, but they didn't have time to finish. I'm stockpile Thomas. When the scourge came, I didn't know what hit me. When I came to, I found myself here in the Nexus. My wife and daughter fell victim to the demons. But I would be worthless in battle. At the very least, I hope to lend my assistance to you brave slayers of demons. I would be happy to lighten your load and look after any excess baggage. So, by talking to the characters in the game right at the start, you can start to see um, how the, we're in a really helpless Best situation. And that's kind of a big theme of Demon Souls, that they're truly trying to hammer home at all times, that this world is really depressing. A lot of people have basically already given up. It's a really a hopeless environment. Oh my. How has this happened? Has God abandoned us for failing to show proper respect to King Alant? Oh, Mbasa. And we'll talk to our blacksmith. Hmm. You're new here? Do you hear for my services? The name's Baldwin. Just an ordinary blacksmith. It's simple. Just bring me all the souls you can. In trade, I'll give you weapons or forge ones you already have. With your souls, I can eke out a living, and with my weapons, you can go on living. Not a bad deal, huh? So this is where you can upgrade weapons at the start of the game. Now, this is also similar to Dark Souls 1, where this blacksmith I can tell you, you're not gonna last long here. doesn't have all the capabilities of some, uh, another one you might meet later in the game. So that's another thing that came from Demon Souls. And the, there's other people who will show up after you beat the first level of the game. So I guess we'll just get right on with it and we'll go to 1-1. One, one. Boletarian Palace, a huge stone castle in the heart of the northern kingdom of Boletaria. Hungry soldiers where souls have been stolen by demons attack trespassers and terrible dragons nest there. Support the note that you have to play this level first. So this level is kind of more similar to, say, the first level of a Dark Souls game where it's still kind of a tutorial but part of the actual game. So in a way, they even kind of realized having an area called tutorial probably wasn't the best idea, because this level definitely still serves as a tutorial, even if it's not quite as upfront about that. Also, these loading screens, are they don't show tutorial tips, which is interesting compared to the other games, or at least showing you items and explaining what they do. Not exactly tutorial tips, but again, it's giving you even less information, so that's another thing that the future games would build upon. So we have a cutscene, the first, the first one in the game besides the introductory cutscenes of going to the tutorial. And it's an interesting use of a cutscene because it's essentially warning you of a trap future, later on in the level. So it's, a, it's very upfront, unlike the future games. Also, there being a secret item back here in the very first level of the game is also something to reward players who are really trying to, uh, uh, you know, who are... Maybe uh, a little bit more observant. You know, it rewards exploration, which is important. Another imp important thing to note is that in Demon Souls, and again, all the Dark Souls games, 
just by looking around, you can see future areas that you might not be able to get to yet, like right there. So there's already a lot going on that is both uh, something either either things that are consistent throughout the whole series or something that was maybe adapted to be better in future games. All right, so let's continue with the level. And I would say probably the, the important thing they try to teach you right here is that you got to respect the enemies in the game because if you just try to run through here you're gonna get ambushed by a bunch of enemies but if you take them one at a time they're pretty easy and you can see them up ahead if you just if you just look but a player who's careless is just gonna wander up these stairs and the next thing they're not they know you're gonna get attacked by a bunch of dragons and we'll actually we'll just demonstrate that you just run a, oh there's a guy you know, we don't, we don't care about him. And that's like, oh, there's, oh, oh, there's a lot of enemies. So right at the beginning, this is literally the first level of the beginning of the game after the tutorial. And the game throws a bunch of enemies at you. And, uh, oh, that guy up there is coming now, too. So let's see, how quickly can you die here? Pretty quickly. And now this is where the player would probably learn about this soul form thing. Where you only have half your life. So, again, now the game is teaching you that the death is punishing as well. Again, this is something that all the games tried to have some aspect of. It might have been more punishing in Demon Souls, or at least it appears that way. So, I, most players probably will die at that part. I know it might have looked easy based on how I just had to stand there. But most new players get over, you know, they, in the heat of the moment, might not make the best decisions. Again, it's the first time playing the game. Most players will die there, and on their second attempt, probably be much more cautious. Actually, you see that enemy break that, see this guy come around here. And then you can start to see, oh, if I'm patient, again, key, a key word of this game, patience, you start to see it's not nearly as hard as it first appears. Although, a new player probably wouldn't know about backstabbing yet, but again, that's fine. Also, a player exploring will probably see this. Can't go in there yet, but again, the player will start thinking, okay, I should explore their secret areas. How do I get in there? And yeah, you can kill these enemies basically one at a time. So the game right at the immediately is gonna teach you take it slow, be patient, observe the level. This is this is very different kind of game design of many games that were around at the time, where it's not it's rewarding you for just being being patient and diligent. Which is, it wasn't really, isn't even still that common of a thing. Um, but in this game, and in the Souls games in general, that's one of the main things they try to teach you. And we miss a parry. Oh, we still get it. And that's important that the game design, the level, we should say specifically, the level design here teaches you that. Because it isn't just the level design where it's rewarding you to be patient observant. It's also the combat. Almost everything in this game comes back to patience, diligence, precision. Not not speed, not, you know, really not even RPG mechanics a lot of times, but just being patient and diligent. And it's really rewarding when you master uh, the ability to play the game in that way and overcome difficulties just by out just by outthinking the game in a lot of ways. The Demon Souls wants you to overcome difficulty just by playing, just by thinking creatively about how to overcome certain challenges. And I think that's why the Souls games became such a success, because not a lot of other action games do that in the same way. It's a very different kind of challenge reward system, especially compared to other action games. In Demon Souls, that's like the, one of the primary focuses of this game. Rewarding you for being patient and observant. And again, it's now... This is another key thing in Demon's Souls. This is actually really simple but effective level design. Now, this is the only way you can go so far. And you go here. You look in here. can't really see anything. You go over here. You can't see anything, but most video game playing people will see that and know there's probably something important here. So you see important door... Door where you're not really sure, and on this door, you see treasure right on the other side. So the player's immediately getting a lot of information. 
and a lot of savvy players would probably guess that might be a boss or the next level. That I have no idea. And this is something I want. Because the way the game's tempting me kind of tells me that. Again, this is level design telling the player things without telling them anything. So many games fail this aspect because they will just have, there might just be a thing, a text bubble or a fairy that says, oh, you should, you know, treasure is important in this game. Demon Souls just shows you a thing and your common sense can deduce, oh, that's probably something important. And then you continue. So around this area, now we see one of another, this is another important level design aspects where a lot of new players will fall in this pit and die, but you can actually lure the enemies, like I just did there, and they will die, which will teach you, oh, that is a death trap. So it's, it's actually a fair trap, but it also, even if the player does die here, which a lot of people did because they saw that those swirling things weren't, didn't know they were, you know, souls, you know, people dying. But again, it's fine. This is the first level. You're supposed to be learning these lessons. So if you die there, you, at least you learn, oh, this game has traps. It's not just combat. There's also traps. So I need to be careful as well. Again, observe, patience, observation. All these things lead, lead back to that. So, and again, you go in this room. Ambush. Sim another ambush. So it's again, it's a, it's a basically a trap. So the, these few rooms here are teaching you that enemies are going to try to ambush you. There's traps. Stay aware of your surroundings. That's kind of a big theme of this whole level in general, which is a big theme of souls in general. It all started right here. So speaking of uh, items and treasures, there's an item behind this debris, which most players are going to see and get. Fire bombs. Now this is another thing that will come in handy later to teach the player about being creative and being smart and trying to figure out solutions to problems that might not be obvious. And we parry and repulse. And I know so far I probably haven't said anything about combat. We'll get into the, the specifics of the combat later, just because this is such an important level in the scope of level design and the scope of how souls teaches the player things and how the level design really functions. So there's just so much to talk about in terms of level design that we'll talk about combat maybe later. And maybe the RPG systems and all that. So this guy is going to throw fire bombs from the top of the staircase. Now this is a aspect where they're teaching you, they're forcing you to fight enemies on narrow ledges. Which, you know, if you maybe were abusing backstabs, I really can't do that here. So this is another, uh, the first time where the restrictions of the level design force the combat to be maybe more difficult. That's another consistent component of Souls, and it's a good way to give your level design some depth. Because if the level design can reinforce the combat mechanics, then your level design has more uh, versatility. It can do more things. Because you don't, that means you don't always need some level gimmick. You don't always need some, like, say, poison swamps or gravity just having a narrow passageway alone can drastically change the uh, difficulty of level or how the combat plays out and that's demon souls does that quite effectively here we have two enemies throwing fire bombs at us two draglings in a fairly narrow passageway that can be a tricky part and speaking of gravity this is one of the first parts in the game where there is a potential gravity death a cliff but the it's now here's the interesting thing here it's set up in a way where the player is not very likely to die from falling they actually put the enemy in the more in the more precarious position he's up here next to the path next to the cliff i should say where the player comes from the opposite side where he's going to see the cliff before anything happens and he's on the safe side where there's, see, there's no cliff over here so the first time they introduce you to this aspect of, of the game where there's cliffs and you could fall to your death, they actually make it very safe and they actually set it up in a way where the player can use it to their advantage. So they're being very fair and very forgiving for this first introduction to that concept. Again, this is the first level. It makes sense. And they're also potentially teaching you that you can use the level design to your advantage too. It isn't always the enemies that are going to have the advantage. You can... You could fall, you could die because of a cliff, but you can also kill enemies with a cliff. And actually, maybe we can demonstrate that right now. Or I cannot because I forgot I had a catalyst in my right hand. 
All right, he's gonna continue to walk back. All right, that's good. Bye. Well, there we go. So in here, speaking of traps, there's a trap in here. This is the first, uh, now I should actually mention, they reuse this exact same trap in Dark Souls 1. Exact same trap. And even a similar uh, type of thing where in, in Dark Souls 1, the boulder breaks open a wall to reveal Oscar, which you need to do for the rest of the, to continue with the game. In this game, it's for treasure, a weapon. So again, it's not only is it the same type of trap, but it's even the same type of rewarding of observation. Although in this game, it's more subtle and not mandatory. It's, again, very similar. Again, so many things in Dark Souls 1 are taken right out of Demon Souls. Getting shot in the back, but that's fine. We'll be back there later. First time in the game where you find this enemy, who's a very dangerous enemy compared to everything you fought so far. It does a lot more damage. He has a lot more health. But here's the interesting thing. He's pretty slow. He's pretty slow. Like, look at that. Look at how much recovery he has on that attack. I had, I even purposely waited just to show how much time you had to get a backstab on him. You have so much time to punish him for that. So that's an interesting thing about Demon Souls. Some of the enemies can be very tanky, potentially tanky. They can be very hard hitting. But they are extremely slow. Meaning, if again, if you're patient and observant, you can just wait for your moment, you can easily take care of them. Like, just using your defensive mechanics. Blocking. Rolling. And it's pretty easy to get the better of them. Like, you can get backstabs on, backstabs on them so easily. Like, look at that. So that's a main theme of this game, and that's something that's pretty, again, pretty consistent with the whole series. I would say as the games progressed, they made that less extreme, which I think is a good thing. On uh, Demon's Souls, it's a little, a little bit overkill. The enemies are ridiculously slow in a lot of ways. The recovery on their attacks is sometimes a very forgiving. You can sometimes have even up to almost three seconds to react to an enemy missing you and hitting them. And, uh, I would say starting with uh, Dark Souls 1 DLC and on, they started to make it a little more nuanced. Made it a little bit more deeper of a system. I would, as much as I'm uh, talking about how good this game did a lot of things, that's one aspect where it's a bit extreme. A little too, I would say, the combat a little too shallow there. It rewards defensive play too much. It rewards reactionary play a little bit too much. We'll talk about them more as we see more examples of that but it is something to keep in mind so here is where the player can get creative for the first time we've been picking up fire bombs a lot in this game now all these enemies have uh, weapons on fire and as we saw up a, up above that one dragling destroyed those barrels with a fire attack so the game teaches you that fire damage destroys those barrels and the fire bombs have fire in the name so if we try to use these to our advantage we can use those barrels against the enemies. And look at that. An area that was potentially very dangerous. Not so dangerous anymore. Just one enemy. We'll be careful. And then take care of it. So now, if the player gets to this point, they're obviously going to hit this switch. And, because, and they're immediately going to realize, oh, wait a second. That was that treasure that I saw behind the gate. And oh, it's a short... So, so many things come together here. One, if the player attack those chains, they see that being interactive in the level is rewarding you. Now, again, keep in mind, the player might not do all these things. But again, we're just trying to explore the game design aspect. And the player not discovering everything the first time is expected and okay. But again, just... So, keep that in mind, but it's okay. Um, again... Shortcut. Oh, oh, okay. If I get to that point, I can now get up there, which means dying isn't as bad. It's I've made pro actual progress. And secondly, this is the important item I wanted that I saw earlier. Cling ring. Here's my ring slots. 
Lose less HP when in soul form. A mysterious ring forged in the shape of an eye character loses less HP after becoming a soul. And oh my goodness, you have more HP now. So if the player gets to this point, they're going to be really... The game is could have been very punishing up to this point, but now it's immensely rewarding. The shortcut, this item, that is... The first part, there's a reason why they tried to make that as rewarding as possible. Because they know this is the first time in the game where the player is accomplishing something. The first time in the game where you're getting some some tangible progress. So this is the way of the, a way of the game trying to feed you that reward system. To get you to understand why the game is, is enjoyable. Because I know a lot of people, the first time they played this game, up to that point, were not really under, seeing what was enjoyable about the game. Is dying a lot. That's why they give you the double whammy of the cling ring item and the shortcut, and potentially the triple if you get those items from the chains. There's a reason why there's a layered reward system there, because it's the first one, it's a really important one. That is very conscious, deliberate, made, authoritative made level design. That's great. But, again, we shouldn't assume other players might go this way the first time, which is... This is not a rewarding experience that would happen to most players, but again, it's an important experience. So if we go over here, another important level design lesson that players will learn as I get pelted by arrows. Okay. And we get, oh, first time dealing with a spearman. Nothing too much to say. Again, we'll talk about combat later, but it is important to note that the game is still uh, forcing you to deal with different enemies that require different approaches. Okay. So, if we go in here, player will go in here and see an enemy with red eyes, which is the first with a really big weapon. So here's the important thing. Um, I would say 99% of players, the first time they come here, are going to die. Definitely. This power enemy is very overtuned for this part. And again, it's not without warning. If you come out here and see this, a player should be able to surmise that this is probably probably going to be difficult. And there's another path over there, that, so you don't need to come here. But most players will do this anyway and die. And then dying teaches, now teaches them another lesson. That some there are optional pathways that are more dangerous, and sometimes you should just leave. And that, again, that's something that stays consistent throughout the whole series. Like in Dark Souls 1, most people are very uh, have fond memories of going to the graveyard first or New Lana Ruins and dying and dying and dying until they find the bird, learning that, hey, you don't always have to go to a path just because you found one. Now, I'm going to kill this guy right now. and But again, keep in mind, most new players will not. But this is just to explore more of the game. Just, just to keep that in mind, most new players are definitely going to die here. Or maybe I'll die here because I screwed up. That's another thing that could happen. So, yeah, again, don't want to talk too much about the combat yet, but, yeah, magic's way too good in this game, and that is something we will criticize this game for later, and this would be the first example of that. Because, yeah, magic in this game is way too good. But if a player does kill that enemy, they get a lot of that plus 2070 that players probably don't know what it is yet, souls, new moon grass, which is the best healing item the player can get this at this point in the game, and this item over here, which I don't remember, let's see. And not nothing too great. But the important thing is players are gonna find this. It appears to be a lot, big giant door. This is this is something to entice a player. Especially if it's a new player, you're gonna see this big huge building behind this really strong enemy, locked door. They're gonna really want to get in here. And that's I think this is again done very uh, purposely done. This is the first level in the game. In order to show that a giant building like this that's locked they throw this in the first level to, t to try to get across a player that hey this game's got secrets for you there's cool stuff in this game uh if you just keep at it that, that's really really good level design they're throwing that at you right at the beginning of the game to try to enforce the feeling of wonder and excitement into you so now this is the first time we see a fog wall in the actual game this is also another sign that this is where you're supposed to go not that other way we go down here and we see a knight in glowing golden armor. But we'll pretend like we don't see him. We'll pretend like we don't notice it. And another trap. Again, another trap. And also another way 
If the player didn't see that other dragon blow up the barrel, that's another spot where the game is teaching you fire damage blows these up. So the game is definitely being very, really trying to hammer home a lot of things to make sure the player gets it. A lot of people will talk about how Souls doesn't teach you anything. It, you know, it throws you into the frying pan and all that. It's not really true. All these games really do have directive ways to teach you how to play. It's just not through dialogue. It's not through cutscenes. They teach gameplay with gameplay, which I think is the best way to do it. It's more immersive. It's better for role playing. It's better for just being a game in the purest sense of the word. Now, a thing I keep talking about is role playing. A lot of people might not understand. They might be saying, how is that helping role playing by having a guy throw a firebomb that blows up fire things instead of having, you know, maybe a fairy or dialogue box pop up? It's because that dialogue box popping up takes you out of experience and it's not authentic. It's not real. It's not something that would actually happen. Where an uh, enemy trying to kill you by throwing a firebomb at a barrel, explosive barrel, is r real. It is something that actually happened. It keeps you in the experience as opposed to taking you out of it. And here's another little secret side area that players might miss. Good day to you. Care to look over my wares? Mostly stolen, but who's telling you? And now the player will learn that there's, you know, perhaps other characters, other merchants outside of the hub area that could have important things for you. Lots of items. So we'll buy the long sword. You know what? Because we'll make the long sword our weapon of choice throughout the game. Thanks for that. Come back soon. But you know what? Let's chat him up. He has more dialogue. Hello. What can I do for you? Be a brave knight or depraved slave. The demons will snatch your soul, then you'll go mad. And those who dare cling to their humanity are hunted down. It is the end of great Boletaria as we know it. But hell, at least the demons don't send us to our deaths in battle. <laughs> so, wow, there's a lot of important dialogue we just got there. One, he reinforces the, the narrative. But also, did you catch how he, they even said, take your humanity? So Dark Souls 1's whole plot and premise comes right out of Demon Souls. The fact that, you know, you lose what makes you quote-unquote human to this threat. It's a very consistent theme throughout the Souls games. Not so much Bloodborne, that's a different thing, but with even all three Dark Souls games and Demon Souls, that's a consistent plot trend where you not only are you going to die, but before you die, what makes you you is going to be taken from you. And that's, I think, a very powerful storytelling trope. And again, it ties into the gameplay and how players give up the game. So it's, again, it's reinforced through role-playing and also a little uh, maybe a political, political commentary at the end there, which, again, is something that isn't that out of place in even the Dark Souls games. There's this skinny fella clad in fabulous armor who's always mumbling about some mission. He's another one who's managed to stay sane like yourself. Probably some pampered son by the looks of his attire. I'd give an arm just for the buttons off his shirt. Okay, so now... Go ahead, take your time. He's telling us there's... I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> another person here who's, you know, not an enemy. And, uh, he... And again, this is a first sign in this game where the quote-unquote lore of, the, of this game is told to you, you know, Subtly, like he tells you, like, looks like a pampered son. And that's, you know, referring to Astrava being King Alan's son. So if we're a player just hearing that for the first time, we might look around and be like, wait, there's another person. And he's right there. So just a little bit, you know, even if you miss him the first time, if you, you know, if you explore, if you're observant, you can get a hint and then, and then look around, you'll find him. And also treasure over here. Thief ring. An ancient sapphire ring. It subdues your presence, making it difficult to be detected by enemies. Now remember how at the very beginning of the game we talked about how players will probably rush through that first part, die, and then realize, oh, I need to be slower, I need to fight these enemies one by one. A savvy player will remember that moment and realize, like, oh, this ring could help me a lot and put it on and then experiment with it. That was a bold jump. A surprise indeed. Well, now that you are here, pray thee, fend off these dreglings. 
So, there's more barrels here that explode, but a savvy player... Oh. Well, that's not supposed to happen. Demon Souls still got surprised for me. Well, it's no big deal. I can still show off what I was intending to do. So a savvy player, depending on what class they pick, there's a few classes that have ranged options, either magic or a bow, can use that here to use this... Uh, the fact that you're on top of this uh, this wall to kill these enemies with no real danger. And we'll take care of this last guy. I think there's at least three or four classes that have a, a ranged attack. My thanks for your brave rescue. I am Ostrava of Boletaria. Accept this as a token of my gratitude. Now the player will see that, you know, by being nice to characters you meet, you can be rewarded for it, so it's not always a good thing to just kill people you meet. Now I must go. There is something for me to take care of. Okay, interesting. Then you immediately see more traps. Okay, two handing my weapon. Oh, and I just realized I never equipped my longsword that I bought. So while Ashrava's fighting, we'll just do that. But I have to two hand this weapon to use it effectively, and the game tells me that. So that's a little, a first, a brief, a first brief window into the uh, leveling system of the game. So Strava killed that guy for us. Oh, another treasure. And here the player can learn, oh, there's other weapons in this game that I can just find and pick up. So again, exploration is being hammered home. And we're also learning about the RPG systems. And uh, because I was one-handing, I did no damage. So this is another really dangerous enemy in the game. But... Probably the most dangerous besides the uh, the spear guy who guards an area you don't have to go to. But it's, again, important to note, the first time you meet this enemy, they did it in a way where you'll most likely have a Strava with you. So it's not as hard. You'll learn about this dangerous enemy, but it's not going to be nearly as difficult as it will be later on. So the, play, the game is, again, using level design in putting you in a situation where you'll learn about these dangers, but in a safer environment where the player is much more likely to succeed. Again, they're easing you into the challenge in a lot of ways. They're not just throwing you into, you know, a hopeless situation at the start. Again, but, again, only if you've actually been observant, found a Strava, and, know it, and, you know, and being patient, letting him help you. If you just rush in, you probably will just die. So, again, it, while the game can be forgiving, it's forgiving to players who kind of earn it. Which, again, is something very consistent with the whole franchise. So if we come down here, more hidden items. Again, explore, uh, rewarding re uh, rewarding exploration. Lots of enemies down here. Again, this is another example where players could use fire bombs to learn about that trick. We're not going to though, because we already did that. And we want to save our fire bombs. We're going to be we're going to do it the hard way, on purpose. I mean, we got a Strava with us too. The Strava's going to take well, or he'll just not. <laughs> hey, we'll we'll help you, Strava. We'll help. And another cool thing about this is if the player's been having a lot of trouble up till now, and this is a good storytelling device that the game uses a lot throughout this, uh, the franchise uses a lot, is that they know that if players are having a lot of trouble, and then they encounter a character who can help them, it's a good way for the, the game to uh, encourage a bond between those NBCs. Because if a player's really having a tough time, Getting help even from a non-human person can do a lot for the morale. And really, help again, strengthen role-playing. Let them really, uh, really encourage them to care about these other characters. Because imagine a player dying here over and over again and meeting this random guy named Estrada. No matter how far I venture, only the soul staff remain. Is there a single sane person left in Boletaria? And then maybe having the same thoughts he did, like, yeah, this sucks, man, thanks for the help. You know, it's, little touch like that can go a long way. And this, it's actually something I've talked about in uh, other, in like my live streams and stuff. Um, that's why Solaire is such an immensely popular character. It's why there's so much fan art of him, so much love, is because a lot of players, you know, struggled with the Gargoyle, struggled with Small Arn Scene. And Solaire helped them overcome those difficulties so the player bonds with him in a, in a real way. Again, role-playing. Actual role-playing. It's built through game design. And an ambush here that could be quite dangerous. But we're fine. This longsword has a better moveset than the rapier, in my opinion. 
You have the, the strong attacks cover a lot of horizontal range, which is good for hitting multiple enemies. The, the uh, two-handed light attack is really quick and combo enemies. The running attack, not so good, but it's good in one hand, but we just can't do that yet. Again, covers a lot of horizontal range. Continue on. Just a few enemies over there, but we're not too concerned. We'll just continue. Now, there's another important, uh, important level design thing coming up. It's it's basically like a uh, using a similar uh, trap from the game earlier, but in a different way to show the player that, again, by being savvy, you can uh, use the level against itself. And they now they put you have the first time force you to fight an enemy like that that blue eyed knight with an with an archer nearby. Again, just upping the ante a little bit. And we don't want those throwing knives. So another fog wall, sim signifying that they're another you're further through the game. So here's where it comes into play. If a player is savvy, you can see that there's something inside those. You look up, you can see oh oh, there's boulders in there like that boulder trap. Wait a second. Hmm, what? That's a small little gate. So a savvy player might realize there's something you could maybe do here. And there's a bunch of enemies in this narrow path. Now, I'm not going to say every player figured this out, but it's possible to figure out what's going on here. And just like that, the game teaches you another little thing. And I imagine a lot of players finding it for the first time probably felt awesome about that. Probably felt so good. And oh, what is that? And you can see dragons off in the distance. So again, foreshadowing, warning you of the danger up ahead. Oh, two spearmen. There's always they're always a problem. As we're getting oh my goodness, hit a lot. Holy butts. Alright, we'll just we'll just die here. That's that's fine. You know what I was saying earlier? The enemies are really slow. Well, this is a good example. I was just able to heal three times and be totally safe. In the other, in the future games, that wouldn't have been so easy to that wouldn't have been so easy to get out of that situation. But in Demon Souls, it's really easy to simply run away from the enemies, recover, and start over again. Which, in some ways, is a thing that it can teach players that retreating is good. But another way, it can make combat. It can take away a lot of the tension of the combat. Actually, let's go this way first. Multiple paths. Large empty room, which is building up to this. Now, there's a lot of treasure there. But I'm gonna do I'm gonna play this as a more conservative player and assume that treasure isn't worth it, and we'll just leave that. But again, this is another aspect of the game where treasure, tr obvious trap, dragons, yeah, let's not. Let's not. So let's continue. But again, it, the, there's a reason why I went over there. To note, dragons, right? Dragons. So we come up here and there's a ton of enemies. So just like we learned at the beginning of the game, it's going to be much easier. We take this slow. Wait, what's that? We heard we heard some noise. Alright, whatever. I'm, I'm sure it's nothing. We hear it again. And a player, you know, who's been paying attention and learning the game so far... Isn't gonna die here because there's a lot of you know there's no reason a player upon seeing that many enemies should rush on that bridge. I'd say this trap is actually done much better than it was in Dark Souls One because in Dark Souls One, while there is a warning of the burnt enemies on the bridge, it's not really easy to notice them and there isn't much warning for when you hear the dragon coming and when it actually comes down. Now, I'm sure there are some players who did see the warning signs of the Dark Souls One Hellkite Bridge. But I don't think most players had a reasonable chance of really seeing what was going on before it's too late. Where in this game, most players, you know, you can actually see the dragon right before it happens. Not in a scripted moment that happens, you know, maybe an hour or more before they actually get to the point of the trap. And also, um, you can use this trap for, you can use the dragon to your advantage. Which again is consistent with what the game's been trying to teach you so far. The environmental hazards aren't just against you. You can use them for your own purposes, which is cool. 
And you see the dragon again. Take out him. Okay. So now we'll wait for the dragon, then we'll be good to go. he'll leave now. Yep. So now that we've seen the dragon do that twice, we know how much time we have. We know we should be fine now. There's only two enemies over here. And we're going to get shot by arrows, because that's always good. And just like that, the player is now going to feel really good about themselves. If they use that dragon to their advantage, they got past all those enemies. And they hear the dragon coming back. And here's where the player finally completes the level. And, do, and having the completion of the level after this part, I think is really key. Because I think everything kind of comes together right there. They have a section similar to the beginning of the level where there's a bunch of enemies. The player uses what they learned earlier to be patient, draw the one enemies out one at a time. They also learn, use a trap to their advantage that they learned earlier at the beginning of the game. They use a lot of components that they should have learned earlier to overcome this, and by doing so, they complete the level. And uh, now players will that remember that big door are going to realize, oh, it is a boss, clearly. And a lot of players are going to think, I knew that was a boss. Um, well, now, the reason I say that the level's completed, even though there's more areas to the level, is that that's the boss room and it's open, and the start of the level is right there. So the level is essentially completed. And the most important part of the level, it has been done. But we'll continue through this part, even though it's not even really necessary. So, this is actually a very tricky room here. They put two spearmen and a sword and shield guy in the corner. It's easier to, and he'll throw firebombs. Easier to lure them out, take advantage of them when they're at this corner. Or we'll just get hit a lot. Rolling into them is not advised, but I got away with it, even though I took a lot of damage. Okay. And now we can continue. Oh, you block. Okay, so another area. Now, remember, this is actually really well done by the game here. Hold on, let's get this juggling to fall. So this is the second, really the second part of the game where falling to your death is a potential a pretty serious concern. Now, remember how the first time that happened, we came from it from the safe side, but here we don't. Here, right at the pathway, we need to, we come right from the dangerous side. So here it's been, the ante's been upped, upped, if you will. And there's an enemy who can shoot at you over there. And we're being attacked by multiple enemies. So here it's where it, the, the threat of gravity is a serious concern now. It's not, the game is kind of taken off the kid gloves when it comes to that uh, danger. Again, that's a very small, subtle thing, but pretty important, I would say. So if we continue, a little side area, we can get an item. Nothing major, but again, reinforcing that theme of exploring. And now here's a new enemy, where if we hit it in the front, does no damage, hit it in the back, does a lot of damage. That's really important. So now they're teaching the player the different kinds of enemies are going to have different strengths and weaknesses. And see that projectile attack? Yep, goes all the way up. So we'll continue. And uh, the fact that these enemies are in the very final part of this level is another important aspect when it comes to the boss battle. And we keep getting these turpentines for some reason. Okay. Shard of Hard Zone, the player wouldn't know what that is yet, but hey, upgrade materials. 
and now we're at another switch, and now the player is going to realize, oh, it's the this do what this door was. It's the end of the level, another shortcut. So now I can freely explore the whole level from right from the start. I can go to the, the first part of the level, that shortcut, that shortcut, or the boss. So the game right there, it comes full circle and teaches you that the levels, the levels can be explored more freely if you get progress. So now let's go into this boss battle and try to experience this as a new player. I'll try to just run around and learn what we can. So, oh, it's that enemy in that tower that we just met, but there's a ton of them. And we know they can shoot at us because we already saw that. But we know we have to hit them in the back. Okay. So, the best way to go about this probably be to lure them out one at a time and pick them off. Or we'll get hit. So here's the interesting thing. Now, I know, and a lot of people watching this probably know, these enemies are weak to fire. But there really isn't anything in the game that really spells that out. So a play the only player that's going to find that is through experimentation. There's, you're not just going to know that. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, it, isn't, it isn't necessary. You don't need fire damage to beat the boss, obviously. You can just do this. I mean, we can kill them in two hits. But it is something important to note that they purposely left that ambiguous. They didn't... Well, I think a lot of players probably did find that right here because, again... We've gotten six turpentine and ten fire bombs, but again, it's not necessary, even if it does help a lot. R twos, and we're getting shot. Again, there's a lot of columns here that you can use to hide from the projectiles. Again, another aspect where they're teaching you use the environment to your advantage, even in bosses. Terrain can be helpful. A lot, even in this in this very first boss, there's a lot of little things that are being taught. And again, a lot of players probably did learn about the fire weakness, which is another little tip. Just picking them, and again, picking them off one by one. Again, reinforcing patience and diligence. There we go. Okay. Ooh, a lot of them here facing the wrong way. Oh, or not. Player can take advantage of these moments here. Ooh, getting a lot of kills here. So the player can be rewarded, you know, just by being patient. Being patient. And it's interesting that for a first boss, there's really not a lot going on. I, and again, I think that's done on purpose. Because they don't want a boss that is too gimmicky at the front. This is literally just a boss where you're fighting normal enemies. Like you have been the whole game so far. So as long as you've learned to, how to fight the basics of the combat, you'll be fine. You don't need to worry about dodge timing or a gimmick. Just, just what you've learned so far, being patient. Taking it slow, learning, having learned that you need to hit these guys in the back. Very simple. And the player will be just fine. Not even, it's not even really a boss getting by. It's basically just a lot of normal enemies. I think that was done on purpose. You don't, you don't need the fire damage. Not necessary. Almost there. And the player is rewarded by killing all of these upgrade materials. They don't know they're, up they're upgrade materials, but they'll learn later. And now, this is the first boss, and if the player does it this way, which is probably how a lot of people would, there's even kind of a subtle storytelling thing going on here. Because you end up finding out the boss is just a blob. that doesn't even have any way to attack or defend itself. And the player by lear uh, can learn maybe a little bit more about this if they're savvy. But the important thing to note is, is it's not really put, pushed into your face. It's a very minor thing, but even the blob, it just moves away from you. It just runs away. So again, it's just a little thing where the game is maybe kind of trying to tell you something, but 
you know, maybe it, not everything's what it appears to be. Just trying to get your mind working a little bit, you know? This boss literally cannot attack or defend itself. I guess we're just gonna kill it. Four phalanx. Just murdering this defenseless creature. And that will do it. You shall obtain the demon soul and a power that is beyond human imagination. The demon was destroyed. You revive. You regain your body. Bring more souls. Slayer of demons. So remember that reward. We've been talking a lot about being rewarded. So now the player sees that they get all their health back. So now they finally have that full HP bar. They're not in soul form anymore. And a savvy player will realize, oh, wait a second. I don't need this anymore. And they can do that? No, I have an extra ring slot now. And then what's this? Red demon soul. And they might realize, oh, it's it's not here. It's not a weapon. Oh, what? Well, soul of the demon phalanx. Grant soul holder a large number of souls. Will not use all the making made into spells, miracles, or weapons. So you get the boss's soul as well. So you get a lot of again a lot of multi layered rewards when finally achieving something. So that's kind of how souls it has always worked. You don't get rewarded often, but when you do, you get rewarded very well. It... Welcome back. The monumental awaits the above. Monumental will explain the nexus to thee. The player is now also rewarded with more story and learning what's going on. And like I was saying, um, that's kind of a consistent thing with Souls. The game doesn't want, doesn't like a lot of games try to constantly feed you like a like a drip feed of rewarding. Souls wants you to really earn it. They want you to go through a lot of trouble. To get the reward, but once you do, you get rewarded greatly. Still alive? I am impressed. This is something that might interest us. The black robed maiden of the Nexus looks after the flames. She's a morose type, with eyes occluded by wax. She can control souls like no other. Bring her the souls of men and demons, and she will embolden your flesh and blood with their power. But beware, do not devolve into a foul beast. So now we're being explained about leveling up in a more, in a pretty subtle way, but it is mentioned. And another theme of this game that's again, pretty consistent with the whole, all Dark Souls games, power corrupts the power in this game the power of well in all the souls games the power of souls can corrupt you and that's a big i'd say it's probably most focused on this game although it is a consistent tr theme of power corrupt of the, the, the great great power comes great responsibility that type of theme and how you can become what you hate and all, a lot of things like that pretty cl they're pretty classic storytelling tropes but they're done through gameplay which is really interesting and really well done. We have long awaited you, Slayer of Demons. I am one of the Monumentals. We preserve the fabric of reality. There is something thou needest to know. Once, we too, a scourge of demons faced. In the distant past, under a benevolent rule, the world was united owing to the soul R. Until a lust for power caused the awakening of the Old One. Across the land seeped a colorless deep fog. 
and the world faced extinction at the hands of the demons. Thanks be, we were able to lull the old one back to his slumber, yet only after the loss of innumerable souls, and half the world lost, erased by the fog. In order to mend the fabric of what land still remained, we entrusted six elders with six precious arch stones. One to the king of a small yet diligent land. One to the king of the burrowers underground. One to the wise queen of the great ivory tower. One to the chieftain of lost and ill-fortuned souls. One to the shaman of the tempest-worshipping shadowmen. And the last to the great giant of the northern lands. The archstones were placed at nodes across the earth. We contained the old one inside this nexus and banned the soul arts. Finally, we became monumental, half-living sentinels of the fabric of reality. Alas, the other monumentals have perished, and only I remain. By the power of the Monumentals, the four sealed archstones have been released. Now it is your turn. You must lull the old one back to its slumber and seal it away for all eternity. If not, the deep fog will absorb all that we know. Have you the strength to accept this mission? So we had a choice for like the first time in the game. And this, again, kind of goes across the evil good path. We'll do the, probably what most players would do, the good thing. Yes, we are fortunate indeed to have you. Now, go forth and destroy every last demon. The old one, without demons to feed its souls, will a new servant seek and lure you to its bosom. So... We're finally given a, an objective in the game, an actual plan of how to, uh, you know, basically how to solve this narrative problem. So the main thing as a player we need to do is kill all the demons. So pretty simple. But an important thing to keep in mind is that we're told that the the old one, the one that's behind, you know, the, ca the cause of all the problems, is going to lure it, it's us to it. Which again goes into that concept of Will we be tempted? Will we be corrupted? You know, will we become a foul beast? We neutralized the old one and banned the soul arts. Then we spread the arch stones, and in order to mend reality, monumentals we became. However, man's memory of history is o'er short, and before long he repeated his mistakes. The monumentals perished and the archstones were long forgotten. And the short-sighted King Alant once again aroused the Old One. The monumentals perish, and the short- So now, for the first time, we're told why this is happening. It's being blamed on King Alant. Now we're not giving- now it's important to remember here we're not really be giving we're not really given a specific reason why. She just says short sighted. We're not really told specifically why he did this. That's important to keep in mind because just like Dark Souls, uh, the story is pretty vague at times. Not not really set nothing's really very well I shouldn't say that, but not a lot is very authoritative and explicitly stated. And this is one good example of that. Even the, one of the main, this, King Alan arousing the old one's probably one of the most important plot points because it's kind of what sets everything in motion. 
And even that, we're not given a really strong answer, at least yet, at least now, as to why that happened. Well, good day to you. I can forge weapons. All right, so he will, in this game, you do need to repair equipment. So we'll do that. So we'll talk to the Maiden Black for one of the first times in the game. You come back alive. I need your business. We were told by the Crestfallen Warrior, who has the same act, voice actor in the Dark Souls games, by the way, that she can manipulate souls and embolden our flesh. Brave soul who fears not death. Prithee, lull the old one back to its ancient slumber. We're given items to co-op with. Eye stones separately connect the diffuse world. Should you lose your physical form, remember the eye stone. So it's kind of, by them saying lose your physical form, they're kind of telling you, if you're having trouble with the games, check out these eye stones. Kind of basically telling you the ability to co-op is if, you need, if you're having trouble, which makes sense. Main controls from you and souls of power allows you to aid those who slay demons. What is it? Dost thou seek soul power? We'll say yes. So be it. After all, thou requirest strength. Go forth, touch the demon inside me. Let these ownerless souls become thine own. And we're introduced to the leveling mechanic of the game. So most new players are not going to have any real idea what a lot of these do. And that's, I think that's understandable, because, again, we as we've already learned, you don't really need the, like, you can get by a lot of the game just by being smart, being uh, uh, observing, being patient, and they kind of, I think the point of this is they want you to roleplay, just do what comes naturally. Um, you don't really need to have great stats to have a character who's more than equipped, more than fine to deal with a lot of the game's challenge. So I think that's an intended thing, that you just kind of can't just kind of uh, learn as you go. You naturally kind of learn how the stats work by playing the game. Now we're going to get strength because we can't use the longsword without it. So let's put one point into there. Well done. May thine strength help the world be mended. And now we can one hand the longsword, so that helps. Thou seeketh soul power, dost thou not? Then touch the demon inside me. And now we'll get some vitality, because vitality is always good. And some endurance. And we'll put the rest into vitality. Why not? Art thou done? May thine strength help the world be mended. So let's talk to Stockpile Thomas again. I would be happy to lighten your load and look after any excess baggage. So, the thing in Demon Souls is you can only hold so many items at once. See, item burn in the bottom right corner of the screen. Now, again, this is something I would say they improved in the future games because this is the only game where there's an actual item burden. And uh, I think they realized it was very unnecessary because there's never really a time in the game where it really adds any sort of strategic element to the game and if you just remember to unload things it never really comes into play like let's uh unload everything we don't need our item burden is only 16.4 of 94. it's so it, it's extremely lenient to begin with and it only really punishes you just for forgetting to do this so it doesn't really impact best much assured, your best of so let's talk to Thomas. When the scourge came, I abandoned my wife and daughter and fled like a madman. When I came to, I was in the Nexus. I haven't dared venture outside these walls since. I wish I could do more, but I am ignorant of the world beyond these walls. That candle maiden cared for me during my first days in the Nexus. She says very little, but has a kind heart. She's just the age my young daughter would have been. The poor, poor girl, trapped here with her eyes occluded by wax. 
If only something could be done to help her. Best of luck to you. That hairpin, that belongs to my daughter. Then she didn't make it after all. My dearest little baby, may she rest in peace. May I ask you a favor? Would you mind giving up that hairpin? I'd like to have it in memory of my daughter. You're a saint. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I mustn't forget. It's not much, but please accept this as thanks. I'm a bit ashamed to say, but I found it one day, discarded on the main road. But it seems to possess a strange power. Anyway, I feel that you should have it. It will be happier in your hands. So a lot of things here that are really well done. So one, again, we're being hammered home, the hopelessness and the depressing nature of this game's atmosphere and world. You know, his daughter died, but also that there is still happiness to cling to here. You know, it's not much, like he says, but we did something to cheer him up a little bit and we're rewarded for it. So it's showing me that there's still some things in this world to cling to and that you're rewarded for, you know, trying to help other people that are in this situation and so it's really it's good role-playing good storytelling aspect and also this kind of reinforced the aspect that the item burn and things kind of unnecessary because now if there is a situation where you're out in the world and the item burden actually does hap uh, come into play because you forgot the deposit stuff you can put this ring on to further solve that problem so a few things there and we mentioned before that there's more characters in the nexus now after we beat the first level of the game are you here to face the demons? If so, please free Sage Freak the Visionary from the Dungeon of Latria. I will help you however I can. I can teach you elementary spells. Sage Freak is a gleaming hope for humankind, but I have not the power to save him alone. So now we're being... I see. Suit yourself. Just ensure that you rescue Sage Freak as quickly as possible. Now we're being told that there's other characters out in the world, so if we found a Strava, we now know that that's a consistent thing. But even if you didn't find a Strava, that's a tip that there could be actual people in the levels that we could find and rescue. Oh, you must be another disciple of God. I too am on a quest to fight the demons in the name of the Lord. May I share God's power with you? Do not be bashful. We are both cut from the same cloth. A miracle is a heavenly act, but spells are the acts of demons, the work of soul arts. They have similar effects, and yet one is clearly evil, and the other is clearly good. Magicians, in the end, are mere servants of the demons. So now we're learning about more lore in the game. Miracle. Is they... About how pe some people at least... You wish to train yourself in stoicism. Very well. I pray we meet again. About how there's kind of a rivalry between miracle users and spell users. You know, I think that will be episode one of our Demon Souls game design playthrough. Next level, uh, next episode will probably do one two. That will be all for now. Can I? Am I? Can my guy do a, a little wave? Can we? Can we wave away to the people watching? Thank, oh, thank you, thank you. Have a good one, everybody.